So in this video I want to talk about lead screws. Um, it's a topic that comes up quite a bit on uh, various forums and it's something that people often seem to get wrong. Uh, and that includes um, printer manufacturers. It's something I covered on my blog back in uh, oh, January 2017 or thereabouts, but I've only got about 40 followers on my blog and yet I have 900 uh, followers on my YouTube channel. So I thought I might reach more people by doing a uh, YouTube video. Um, so it kind of covers what I've already said in my blog, but uh, maybe in a bit more depth. So I'm going to cover um, the difference between uh, lead and pitch, and why lead is important and pitch is pretty much irrelevant. Uh, I'll also talk about backlash, what it is, how to deal with it, um, and uh, it's primarily this is all about lead screws and their application in 3D printers. So where is a good place to use them? Where isn't a good place to use them? What lead is good to use? What size of screw and all those kind of things. Um, talk about positional accuracy and speed. And So if you know all that stuff, um, this video isn't for you. If you've got any questions, then keep on watching and hopefully I will explain things and, and, and answer them as best I can. Oh, and if you hit the subscribe button, um, it will encourage me to um, do some more of these videos. Um, if I get to a thousand or something, um, that would be good. I'm currently in 900 and some odd as I record this. Not quite sure how this is going to work out. Um, because I'm just uh, now going to be using this piece of kit to record the audio which means I can do kind of voiceovers when I put slides up and things like that and also I can walk around uh, turn it back on the camera and you'll still get the audio hopefully if I get it all synced if you see my lips moving but it doesn't line up with what you hear you know that I've got that wrong so here's a picture of three screws the top one is a lead screw with a one mil lead. Uh, the next one down is another piece of lead screw with a two mil lead. And the bottom one is a piece of threaded rod, uh, again with a one mil lead. Some people say that you have to use lead screw and not threaded rod, which is kind of confusing because um, a lead screw is a rod with a thread on it. So by definition, it's a threaded rod. The difference mostly is in the thread form. Studding or threaded rod, which is used to fix something, has a V-shaped thread because it has a maximum contact area. So it will give you the highest holding force. On the other hand, lead screws, which are sometimes called power screws, are designed to move something rather than hold something in place. So we don't need the high holding force, but we do need lower friction because it will be easier to move it. So a lead screw usually has a trapezoidal form. And I include Acme threads when I say that because an Acme thread form is trapezoidal in shape. That's to say, rather than the peak and the root going to a sharp point, they're flattened off. Um, here's a picture that I scraped off the internet which kind of demonstrates that a bit better. So by flattening off the, the, uh, the peak and the root, we reduce the uh, the length of the flank, that's the, the side of the thread which is in contact with the nut. Um, so by reducing the contact area, we reduce the friction, which is just what we want when we want a screw for moving something, rather than if we're using a screw to fix something in place. So that's the main reason why uh, trapezoidal threads are used on lead screws. It's really about lowering the friction. Um, now both thread forms, V-shaped and trapezoidal, are made the same way, just with a different shape cutting tool. Accuracy has got nothing to do with the thread form. Lead screws are usually made to a quote with tolerance, whereas studding or threaded rod is often not specified. But both are made the same way on the same machine, just with a different shape cut, uh, cutter. So at a push, you could use what's referred to as threaded rod or studding. It just means it's more likely to bind or stick, especially if you get debris on the thread. But using what's referred to as threaded rod as opposed to a lead screw, it's not a cardinal sin that some people might tell you that it is. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, backlash. So here's another picture. 
basically there has to be some clearance between the nut and the screw. If there's no clearance, then it just won't turn. Um, which means that when the screw turns in one direction, one flank of the thread will push on the nut, but the other flank will be clear of the nut, as you can see in the picture. But if we change direction, um, the, the direction of rotation, then the other flank of the thread will be in contact with the nut. But it's got to take up that clearance first. And the amount that the screw rotates between the change of direction is the backlash. A good way to demonstrate this will be on my milling machine. So this is the X carriage, which moves from left to right. And peering up underneath, this is the lead screw. And this hand wheel is connected to the screw. So when I turn the screw, the carriage moves backwards and forwards. So we can think of that hand wheel as being our stepper motor um, on a 3D printer. Basically, the motor goes around, turns the screw, moves the carriage. So we can see this, uh, this hand wheel has got a dial on it uh, with divisions. Now that dial is actually held on by uh, friction, which means it is possible to actually rotate it. So I can turn it around and uh, line it up with zero or whatever I want to do. So when I started my apprenticeship, this is how we actually measured distance. Um, each division is 0 0.05 millimeters and one complete revolution, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, is two millimeters. So we can say that the lead of the screw is two mil. That's not the pitch of the screw, but we'll come to that later. So if I wanted to um, drill two holes in a part, say four mil from an edge and then eight mil from an edge, first thing I'd do is find the edge. Basically, I won't go into how we do that, but you'd basically turn the carriage that way until you found the edge. And then I would do that, holding the wheel still, turn the dial, make it zero. So that's the edge of the part. So then to go four mil, I go one revolution, which is two, and another revolution, which is four. Line it up, and then I can drill the hole. And then if I wanted to do another hole at eight mil, then I can go another two complete revolutions, drill the second hole. But what if there was a hole at six mil and I had forgotten to do that? There's no point in me turning it back exactly two mil because the first part of that screw travel will be backlash. And so what I would do is go further than two mil and then turn the wheel in the same direction as before is the only way to ensure that it would be six mil from the edge. You can't go to eight mil and then back two. You have to go back kind of three mil and forward one in the same direction. Um, I've got another piece of kit that I can use to demonstrate that, which is my DRO, which is a digital readout. And it works differently because it has um, linear scales that are attached to the actual carriages and um, reading heads that are fixed to the frame. So it accurately measures the position of the carriage and not the position of the screw. Now obviously on a 3D printer we don't have those, we only have the stepper motor that's fixed to the screw. So if I zero the dial, which I have done, and then zero the DRO. Then if I turn exactly two millimeters in that direction, on the dial, that's gone round to zero. That's one complete revolution. It's 
2.005. Not quite really. <laughs> My eyes aren't quite good enough to read 0 0.005 of a mil. Anyway, um, on the dial. But now if I come back one complete revolution, back to the zero point on the dial, that's zero. The DRO is now showing me 0 0.155 because there's 0.155 mil of backlash. That's the clearance on the nut between one flank in one direction and one flank in the other direction. So clearly on a 3D printer that's going to be a problem because we only have steppers that are fixed to the screw. So we can only measure the position if you like or we can only set the position of the screw. We can't set the position of the actual carriage and the backlash is going to change that. That's one um, problem with using uh, lead screws on X and Y um, is backlash. <coughs> now you can get rid of backlash um, or you can reduce it a lot by using um, effectively a split nut. So if you split the nut in half and then push the two halves apart each flank will be in contact on both the left and the right hand side. But when you do that you, you, you increase the friction um, because there's no clearance and you need a slight amount of clearance to be able to turn the screw. If there's too much friction you can't turn the screw. So there will always be a little bit of clearance, there will always be a little bit of backlash and it's going to wear so the backlash will change over time. Uh, so you need constant adjustment. And of course, on a 3D printer, the stepper motors are quite small in terms of their power, the torque that they can produce. So you don't want a lot of friction. The more friction you've got, the harder it is for the motor to work and you, it will stall and you will get slip steps and all the other fine things. So the next little problem with lead screws is speed. If I turn this wheel as fast as I possibly can and you watch what the carriage is doing, it's really not moving very quickly. So again with a stepper motor, um, the faster you run the motor you get to a certain point where the torque drops off because of the speed. So again that's another reason why lead screws on X and Y aren't a good idea. Um, because you're going to be limited on speed. I mean, typically we print at say 60 millisecond or upwards, and I couldn't get anything close to that by manually moving that screw. So one way of doing it, <coughs> or one way of improving that situation would be to use a coarser lead screw. So instead of one revolution being um, two millimeters, it becomes say eight millimeters. But then you need more torque to drive a coarse screw than you do a fine screw because a fine screw has a kind of a gearing effect um, which a coarse screw doesn't so you need more torque and also you lose positional accuracy so on that dial for example one division is 0 0.05 millimeters if the lead of the screw was eight millimeters instead of two then one division will be 0.2 millimeters instead of 0.05. So trying to find a position that's 0.05 of a mil will be just about impossible because you've got to kind of guesstimate in between those divisions, which isn't going to be easy to do accurately. And <clears throat> there's an analogy there with those dial divisions and full steps on a stepper motor. But I'll come to that later. Uh, but what about the z-axis? Well this this wheel on the top is another lead screw and that effectively um, is my z-axis travel. And uh, if you look while I'm doing this I'll zoom in on the DRO a bit and look at the lower digits. This is a z and I'll just gently move this wheel backwards and forwards and you can see that as soon as I touch the wheel, as soon as I move it, the uh, 
the, posi the Z position changes, changes instantly. There is no backlash on the Z axis. And the reason for that is gravity, basically, with the carriage unlocked as it is. This lump is pretty heavy, so gravity is always pushing it down. So the same flank of the screw is always in contact. It can't, it can't not be, if you see what I mean. So however I turn that, whether the screw goes up, whether the thing goes up or down, it's still the same part of the thread that's in contact. So the same thing applies on the z-axis of a printer, generally. If you've got a reasonable mass uh, for your bed, which hopefully you have, hopefully you're using a nice thick chunk of aluminium as a um, as a build platform it'll have some mass and hopefully the guide should be nice and free so it's free to move up and down then the gravity <coughs> is going to take care of the backlash for you you don't need to use anti-backlash nuts on Z um, because of that reason if um, if the, the build platform is quite light and uh, flimsy as some of these cheap kits can tend to be um, then those kind of uh, anti-backlash nuts that have a spring in between them uh, might help. Uh, but generally um, this shouldn't be necessary because gravity is always pushing down on the bed. And then of course the other thing with the z-axis is that we don't care about high speed um, apart from homing but we can live with it being a quite a slow speed for homing. Uh, but most moves are only whatever the layer height is, 0.2 mil, 0.3 mil, whatever. Um, so speed is, is kind of irrelevant. Um, so lead screws are fine for the z-axis in my opinion, um, but not a good idea for X and Y because of the backlash and the speed. So now I want to talk about lead versus pitch because they're not the same thing and it's one of my real pet hates when people use the wrong term. So the pitch of a screw is the distance between the thread forms, between two peaks or two roots, whatever. The lead of a screw is how far a nut will travel in one revolution. Now with a stud, bolt, threaded rod, whatever, invariably they are single start screws and the lead and the pitch happen to be the same thing. But lead screws can be multi-start screws and in a case like that then the lead is not the same as the pitch. Basically the lead is the pitch times the number of starts of the screw. So here are some pictures. I mean, they, these are something that I've kind of knocked up on OpenSCAD. So this first one represents a, uh, a two mil pitch single start screw. Now this one looks very similar to the last one but it's actually, um, it's two mil pitch, but it's a four start screw. So the lead is actually eight millimeters. But looking at the side, the thread forms look very similar to each other because the pitch, the distance between the peaks is the same. If we look at the top of a single start screw, it looks kind of like this. And if we look at the top of a four start screw, it looks like this. Now, why would you want to use a multi-start screw? Well, the reason again is kind of contact area. If we just had, if we had an eight mil lead screw that was single start, it would look like this. So as you can see, there isn't much contact area so there's not much strength um, so it would be easier to easy to strip that thread if we have four threads each one starting 90 degrees to the prior one 
then we end up with four individual spirals that have a lead of eight millimeters but each one being offset by 90 degrees it means the pitch the distance between each one each spiral is two millimeters so when you're talking about lead screws it's important you talk about the lead and not the pitch pitch is kind of irrelevant it's how far a nut will travel in one revolution and that's what you need when you set your steps per mil it's the lead not the pitch so if we decided to use lead screws for our z-axis which is fine perfectly reasonable thing to do um, because we've got gravity taking care of backlash um, then uh, the next question is what size lead screw should one use and um, i sometimes see comments on forums people wondering if 8 mil will be enough to hold their bed or whether they should go to 10 mil or whatever well from a um, it kind of makes me chuckle really um, from a load point of view uh, this is a piece of three mil threaded rod and i did some quick uh, calculations the other day if you got a bed that laid that weighed say 10 kilograms which is heavy uh, more than my big bed here um, and you had a rod three mil rod that was a meter long uh, and that's all that was holding that 10 kilograms then that rod would elongate by about 0.07 millimeters and of course you never have just one rod you'd have at least two hopefully you got three so from a uh, from a holding point of view from a strength point of view you don't need <laughs> you don't need even three mil that's that's enough but there is um but what can happen is when you home the printer that needs that needs to spin quite quickly um, that's where you get a fastish moving z and if the rod's too thin and it's long instead of just kind of spinning about its axis it can whip it can do that and with a lead screw lead screws should only provide the motion they shouldn't be used as linear guides they just lift the bed up and down um, you have separate guides that constrain it from moving side to side or twisting or anything like that the, but the screw should just provide the lift so for that situation you don't want to constrain both ends of the screw uh, because if you don't get them perfectly aligned then they're going to fight against the guides or try and pull the bed in one direction and the guide is trying and trying it not to um, so it's better just to leave one end of it free but as i say if the screw is too thin and it's quite long when you drive it at high speed it can whip around like that so that's really the only reason why you need to kind of increase the diameter it's not it's not the force required to hold the bed uh, you ain't going to strip the thread or anything like that just with the weight of the bed unless you've got something seriously heavy and you're using seriously small screws um so jim you know as a rule of thumb i would say don't i'd never use anything less than eight mil myself um just because of this whipping thing but then my screws are nearly like a, a meter long um, if you've got short amount of travel you could use six mil that would be a, a good rule of thumb so really the longer the screw the the bigger the diameter needs to be to stop it whipping 10 mil might be a better choice on my machine depends on how fast i drive the, the z-axis but I'm, I'm happy enough with eight mil so i see um i see a lot of printers and a lot of people use um eight mil lead on their screws they're generally two mil pitch four start screws which is an eight mil lead so one revolution is eight mil um, which for a z-axis in my opinion that's a bad idea it's too coarse but we'll do some maths and i'll explain that a bit better uh, later in my opinion that a two mil lead is the optimum so We'll get on to the maths and I'll explain why. Going back to my milling machine and the dial that's on the hand wheel, 
I said there was an analogy between those uh, small divisions and full steps on a stepper motor. So what I kind of meant was if, um, if the lead on that screw had been 8mm instead of 2mm, and if I wanted to move it 0.05mm, then I would need to position the dial accurately three quarters of the way between two divisions. And that's kind of an analogy with a stepper motor. Um, they're quite good at going to full steps. But if you want to uh, position the stepper motor so that it's part way between full steps, then it's got to accurately supply the right current to hold it um, in place. Ideally, we want to use full steps for positional accuracy rather than try and guesstimate a position between two full steps. So I've done a spreadsheet showing some calculations. They assume a 1.8 degree motor and a 1.8 degree motor therefore has 200 full steps per revolution. So with an 8 mil screw it means that the full steps per mil are 200 divided by 8 which is 25 which means that for a 0.1 mil it's 2.5 full steps. Typical layer heights might want to be 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4 etc. That kind of order. So we can see with the 8 mil screw the only two combinations out of all that lot that are full steps are 0 0.2 mil and 0.4 mil. Every other combination, every other layer height would need a fraction of a full step. So the, the 0.1 and the 0.3 and the 0.5 would be something and a half full steps. Uh, but the 0.15s and the 0.25s and the 0.35s and the 0.45s was going to be three quarters of a full step, which is not desirable. Moving on to a 4mm lead screw, then it's 200 over 4, it's 50 full steps per millimetre, or 5 full steps for 0.1 of a millimetre. So that's a lot better because all the even layer heights, all the layer heights that are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, they all use a number of full steps. So positional accuracy there would be fine if you had layer heights that are multiple of 0 0.1 of a mil. Uh, but if you want to use 0 0.15, 0 0.25, 0 0.35 or something, then again you're going to rely on micro-stepping to get you the positional accuracy which is something you want to avoid ideally. So the last one is the 2 mil lead screw. And you can see there that every layer height from 0.1 to 0.5 mil in 0.05 of a mil step is a number of full steps. So there's no reliance on micro stepping for positional accuracy. Which is why, in my opinion, 2 mil lead gives you the optimum for any layer height that you might want to use. But my, my original screws on my printer were 1 mil lead. So when you want to home it, you've got to move it twice as fast, uh, which might be limited. The, the motor itself, um, once it gets to a certain speed, will be limited on torque. So you might not be able to home it very quickly. So for me, a 1mm lead was overkill, um, and 2mm is the optimum. It's the best compromise between resolution, accuracy, if you will, and speed, in my opinion. So in summary, lead screws are fine for the Z-axis. In my opinion, the optimum size is at least 8mm diameter. You can go bigger, and the optimum lead is 2mm because that will give you, you can use whatever layer height you want with that and you'll always be within a full step. We're not gonna be relying on micro-stepping for positional accuracy. If you want to use 
lead screws for X and Y, then you need a coarser lead because you won't get the speed otherwise. You're going to need some pretty hefty motors because of that coarse lead. And also, if you're going to take care of backlash, you need to overcome that friction as well. And because you can never completely eliminate backlash, you need to measure the position of the gantry rather than the position of the screw. So ideally you need a separate linear encoder on the gantry itself rather than on the screw because we've always got this bit of backlash that can happen, which is generally why it's a lot easier to use a belt driven system for X and Y. So I guess that about sums it up. Um, if there's something I haven't covered or you've got any questions or you want to argue about something, um, leave, leave a comment. And uh, yeah, give this a like if you want to see more videos like this. Um, hit the subscribe button. That'll be good. Bye for now.